Hello everyone, it's me, and today let's watch this classic video together. Let's go. I'm placing an ad for a housekeeper. Classic. Hello. Hello. Are your kids well behaved? <gasps> me of someone you will follow a schedule those who do not follow the schedule will be punished Internet, welcome to Film Theory. Hello, Internet, welcome to Film Theory. Hello. <laughs> Removing the nostalgia glasses from your eyes and grinding them under our digital video heel every week. On the chopping block mm. today, the beloved 1993 family comedy, Mrs. Doubtfire, which, if you grew up in the 90s, you'll understand beloved is an understatement. This thing was a staple in everyone's VHS collections, a yearly, if not daily watch for a lot of kids around the country. Like most of Robin Williams' movies, it was an instant classic, simultaneously yes. hilarious and heartwarming in that unique way that only he could do. For those of you who haven't seen the film before, here's the brief overview. Robin Williams, aka Daniel Hillard, is a talented voice actor living with his wife Miranda and three kids in San Francisco, California. Early on in the film, Miranda files for divorce after Daniel throws a wild birthday party for their son. Because he doesn't have a regular job or place to live, the family court judge grants primary custody to Miranda, only allowing Daniel to have visitation rights for a few hours every week. Daniel, devastated that he can't see his kids every day, does what any normal parent would do. Mmm, now that's interesting. What is the normal thing that you will do? Hmm, what will you do then? Use professional grade prosthetics to disguise himself as an elderly British woman in order to get hired as his children's nanny. At <laughs> yep, bet you didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> As you can imagine, hilarity ensues as Daniel struggles to maintain his double life. But what you were really laughing at weren't the antics of a dedicated loving father, but really the machinations of a morally bankrupt criminal. Oh, sure, he opposes advertising cigarettes to children. Pudgy the parrot has a cigarette shoved into his mouth, is morally irresponsible. Millions of kids see this cartoon. It's like sending each one of them a packet of cigarettes and saying, light up, and gives this heartfelt speech at the end of the film. In regards to my behavior, I can only plead insanity because Ever since my children were born, the moment I looked at them, I was crazy about them. But I'm here today to expose Daniel not just for his crimes, but also his behavior that, quite honestly, should warrant him seeing a mental health professional. So it's time to crack open those law books and find out whether Daniel Hillard will be exchanging his dress and wig for an orange jumpsuit and, um, not dropping the soap. Before we begin, we have to determine okay. which- mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Dropping the soap. Mmm. Let's keep this family friendly and wholesome. Thank you so much laws to use when judging Daniel's actions throughout the film. Although it's not officially stated, Mrs. Doubtfire is known to take place in San Francisco, California. Multiple scenes show San Francisco landmarks, and the climactic scene of the film takes place at Bridges Restaurant. Very nostalgic and classic feeling. Which is a real-life establishment located in the Bay Area. Therefore, the United States, the state of California, San Francisco County, and the city of San Francisco all have jurisdiction over Daniel. Additionally, the movie was created in 1993, so I'm going to try to only look at laws that were on the books around that time. Wow, this video is nearly 30 years old. Okay, the... Not this video lah, this video came out year 2018, but the video that is covering on it. So now that we know which laws are applicable, let's start going through the film. From the opening moments, Daniel's self-destructive habits are clearly on display. The first scene has him actively sabotaging an important voiceover job. This session is costing the studio thousands of dollars. If you want to play Gandhi, then do it on somebody else's time. If you leave, you're not coming back in. Then I've got to do what I've got to do. And he's not wrong to walk out of this job, but at this point, he chooses to spiral downward even further in his self-destructive habits by throwing a blatantly out-of-control party for his kids. A party that he clearly recognizes is against the wishes of his wife. Party? Yes! No. Yeah. Mom said you couldn't have one because of your report card. Mom's not gonna be home for another four hours. No, you shouldn't do that. You really shouldn't do that. As a role model, as an adult in a family, people look up to you for responsibilities. Someone they can rely on. And if you are doing something so irresponsible, 
quite hot for you to party that also happens justify. to be highly illegal. Are you aware that it's illegal to possess animals of a barnyard nature in a residential area and also responding to a noise ordinance violation? How illegal? Well, funny enough, I couldn't find anything about possession of barnyard animals in a residential neighborhood on the books. However, I did find Article 1, Section 37, Clause C of the San Francisco Public Health Code, which prohibits okay. the possession of hooved animals within a residential district. Not exact, but pretty darn close. Both goats and horses, which are seen during the scene, would be a direct violation of the statute, resulting in a punishment of about $100 and approximately 30 days in county jail. Since oh this would be his first offense, the jail time would probably be waived. And for the noise violation, Daniel would only be fined another 100 bucks, as specified by Section 291Y of the San Francisco Police Code. That's a lot of offense just from the start. Regardless, let's recap. In the first seven minutes, the hero of the movie has shown himself to be self-sabotaging in both his job and in his relationship, as well as be liable for at least $200 in criminal fines and possibly 30 days in prison. Sure, the movie frames Daniel as the cool dad who's being henpecked by his stick-in-the-mud workaholic wife, but the subtext here is that we have an unhappy man who rebounds from misfortune by engaging in even more self-destructive behaviors that he knows knows are wrong. Don't you dare make me out to be the monster here, Daniel. You have all the fun and I get whatever's left over. Wait, Why uh... am I the only one that feels there has to be rules? And that spiral just continues throughout the movie. This opening scene results in Miranda getting a divorce from Daniel and her winning sole custody over the kids. Because he doesn't have a home or any form of employment, Daniel is only allowed to have visitation rights on Saturdays. Every Saturday, it's one day a week. That's not enough. Unhappy with the court's ruling, Daniel devises the plan to disguise himself as a British nanny in order to trick Miranda into hiring him so he can spend more time with the kids. All this while Miranda finds herself a new boyfriend, Stu. And this is where the plot of the movie and Daniel's crime spree truly begin. You it triggers down. See, I know it was a common trope of movies, especially in the 90s, to portray step parents as evil. But unlike other films, Stu actually makes an effort to bond with these kids and seems very genuine about his relationship with them. Keep it sincere, genuine, from the bottom of the heart. One of his buddies even asks why he's dating someone with baggage, and he responds by saying that they're terrific kids. I'm crazy about them. So what does Daniel do to this unusually good-natured boyfriend? He takes advantage of his generosity, vandalizes his car, and then nearly murders him. You know, family-friendly comedy stuff. It's okay to kill your romantic rival and kid's possible stepdad. In one scene, Daniel, dressed as Mrs. Doubtfire, takes the ornament off of Stu's Mercedes. Since he, quote, maliciously damages property that he does not own, end quote, it would technically be considered vandalism by the California Penal Code and would result in a thousand dollar fine and potentially another year in- Hmm, okay, so there's a monopoly cut of the go to- okay. County Jail. California is not messing around, you American vandals. Never seen that show, but Phil DeFranco says it's good. I might have to check it out. In a later scene, Daniel, once again disguised as Doubtfire, is at a bar and hears Stu criticize him as a negligent father. What can I say, Ron? The guy's a loser. Daniel responds by throwing a blindsided lime at Stu. I saw it. Some angry member of the kitchen staff. It was a run by fruiting. Believe it or not, this too can be considered a crime. A district attorney would likely classify it as battery, defined as, quote, willful and unlawful use of force or violence upon the person of another. Vandalism? Better. End quote. Which adds another $2,000 fine and potentially six months of county jail time to Daniel's ah. growing rap sheet. But all of ah. this is small potatoes. Or should I say small... From 1993 in... Limes when compared to Daniel's most violent crime of the entire film, the near murder of Stu. The movie what? culminates in a final chaotic scene where Daniel has to keep shifting back and forth between his two identities. Amongst all this mayhem, Daniel takes the time to steal a chef's jacket, sneak into the kitchen, and then add pepper to Stu's shrimp, despite being very well aware that Stu is allergic to pepper. I'll have the jambalaya. And make mine not spicy, I'm allergic to pepper. When the food is served, Stu begins to eat it and immediately has himself an allergic reaction. Not a funny sort of reaction, a dangerous one. Daniel recognizes his mistake, exclaiming, Oh no, I killed the bastard. Before successfully giving him the Heimlich maneuver. Now, clearly this is a crime, but what sort of crime is it? Well, if Stu had died like he was on the verge of, it would have been tried as voluntary manslaughter, in which someone is killed unintentionally during a crime of passion, often being provoked while tensions are high. In this case, Daniel sprinkling the pepper was meant to be a harmful Prank. Just a prank, bro. 
But at no point did he intend to kill Stu, as evidenced by him doing the Heimlich to save him. If there had been intent to kill, but still no planning, then this would have been tried as attempted second-degree murder. Regardless, no one dies. So does this mean that Daniel gets himself off scot-free? Absolutely not. For starters, Daniel violated Section 347 of the California Penal Code, which states, quote, Every person who willfully mingles any poison or harmful substance with any food, drink, medicine, or pharmaceutical product where the person knows or should have known that the same would be taken by any human being to his or her injury is guilty of a felony punishable by imprisonment in the state prison for two, four, or five years. Now, clearly, Daniel knew that adding a metric ton of pepper to Stu's dish would cause him some level of injury. So with that, we can add another five years to Daniel's sentence. Other possible crimes Daniel could be on the hook for here include reckless endangerment, battery, and, on the extreme end, assault with a deadly weapon. Okay, wow, that escalated quickly. No, Pepper might not seem like a deadly weapon, but since Daniel knew it was harmful to Stu, a lawyer could absolutely make a case for it, which would yield a sentence of up to four years in county jail and a fine of $10,000. So, between the party violations, vandalism, battery, and poisoning, Daniel Hillard could be facing around $13,200 in fines, and an upwards of 10 years in prison. As large as that may seem, though, we still haven't touched on his biggest crime. What? Wait, what? His biggest crime yet? Oh yeah, almost killing his romantic rival is far from the biggest thing Daniel has to worry about. We've overlooked something major up to this point. So major, in fact, that it could increase Daniel's sentence four times over. And the thing that I've overlooked up till now is the point of the entire movie. You see, according to the terms of divorce announced by the judge at the beginning of the movie, Daniel Hillard is only allowed to see his children for a few hours every Saturday. For the rest of the week, Miranda has full custody. Since this divorce agreement is a legal decree, intentional violation of it is considered contempt of court. In order to be convicted of contempt of court in the state of California, the defendant must have knowledge about the order in question and then willfully have violated that order. Now, clearly Daniel had knowledge about the divorce agreement since he was present in the courtroom when it was decided. And the violation of the agreement was absolutely intentional on the part of Daniel. Not like the children happened to see him while he was working at the TV studio. Daniel became a nanny expressly to sneak into his former home and see his children. This is a crystal clear example of contempt of court, which is punishable by a maximum sentence of one year in county jail and a thousand dollar fine. But that's not all. For some court orders, including family court matters and restraining orders, the California Penal Code mandates that, quote, each contact shall constitute a separate violation. This ah. means that each time Daniel actively saw his kids outside of the court mandated hours is considered a unique offense. At the end of the film, it's revealed that it's been two months since the initial divorce hearing. Your Honor, in the past two months, I've secured a residence, I've refurbished that residence and made it an environment fit for children. At five days a week for eight weeks, Daniel would be charged with up to 40 cases of contempt of court. This alone would be upwards of 40 years in jail and a $40,000 fine. So if you tack on all the other offenses, which look gracious in comparison now, Daniel could potentially be spending nearly 50 years behind bars and paying over $53,000 in legal fines. Now, Obviously, these figures were calculated using the maximum sentencing requirements for each infraction, so there is possibility that Daniel could have been given a shorter sentence by the jury or received parole for good behavior. However, I don't think many jurors and judges are going to be sympathetic to a man who almost murdered someone while dressed up as an elderly British woman so he could sneak into his house and basically kidnap his kids from a legal standpoint. <sighs> Alright, um, once again, please do remember to have good morals, and please be understanding towards other people as well, not just yourself. Be, be understanding towards other people, be respectful, be polite towards other people. People make mistakes, big or small, that's the same. Um, mistake, are, mistake can always be, mistakes are always forgivable if one of the correct strike me them. Isn't that correct? But the worst twist of all is that at the beginning of the movie, it's made clear that... I'm giving you three months, Mr. Hillard. Three months in which to get a job, keep it, and create a suitable home. If this proves to be a possibility for you, I will consider a joint custody arrangement 
when we reconvene. All he needed to do was wait for three months and his problems would have been solved. Instead, he self-sabotages yet again. This time, actively throwing away the last remaining shred of happiness in his life, his kids. And because of his actions, the soonest that he'll see them is when they're ready to join AARP. You can't <sighs> even claim he was ignorant to all of this. Daniel openly recognizes what he's doing halfway through the movie. Immediately after revealing his true identity to his kids, Daniel says, if she finds out, I'll only be able to see it through plate glass. Maybe the best way to see your kids would have been to stay out of the clink, you Mary Poppins reject. Miss For three months. Moreover, you must understand that, um, in some cases, with good intentions, but with bad results, it can be understood as what? Maybe, I'm not too sure, but maybe, he has good behaviours. He have good intent. Or maybe she la, of course. Maybe she, of course. Um, and if the system is too harsh, maybe give it a thought to change it for the better. This Doubtfire isn't the happy, family-friendly, inspiring movie that we grew up watching. It's about one man systematically and knowingly destroying the happiness in his life one piece at a time. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Wow. I didn't expect that this episode will touch on such a sensitive and... S sensitive and really heartfelt uh, thought about it. About it on this, on this video. Yeah, that's very interesting to watch. Yeah, very profound. <laughs> Well, anyways, um, if you do like this video, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to my channel, and comment down below if you have any channel us. Don't forget to follow my channel, and I sincerely appreciate all of your support and encouragement for my work. Thank you so much. It's very motivating and inspiring for me to continue. Very encouraging. Thank you so much for your positivity, and I hope to see you all in my next video. But, hey, that's just theory. A film theory. And cut. And I hope to see you all in my next video. Thank you so much. Um, subscribe. Thank you.